Bell's palsy, named after the surgeon Charles Bell who first described it, is when there's weakness or paralysis of the muscles on one side of the face, caused by damage to the seventh cranial nerve, which is the facial nerve. The underlying cause of cranial nerve damage is idiopathic, which means it's unknown. So when there's facial nerve paralysis from a known cause like a stroke, a tumor, or trauma, it's not considered a Bell's palsy. George Clooney had this disorder for nine months when he was a teenager. Broadly speaking, the nervous system has two parts. The central nervous system, which consists of the brain, brain stem, and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which consists of all of the nerves that fan out from the central nervous system. Peripheral nerves that emerge from the brain and brainstem are called cranial nerves, and there are a total of 12 pairs of them. The seventh cranial nerve, the facial nerve, emerges from the brainstem, and then enters the temporal bone where it travels through a narrow, Z-shaped canal, called the facial canal. The facial nerve exits the skull through a tiny hole called the stylomastoid foramen. From there, the facial nerve branches off to different facial muscles that help with facial expression, like the ones you use while whistling to your favorite song. Ultimately, control of each side of the face comes from a region of the brain called the motor cortex. As an example, let's start with the lower half of the right side of the face. An upper motor neuron extends down from the left motor cortex, goes across the midline in the brainstem to the right side, and then meets with a right lower motor neuron which hitches a ride on the right facial nerve. For the upper half of the right side of the face, things start similarly. There's another upper motor neuron that extends down from another region of the left motor cortex, also goes across the midline in the brainstem to the right side, and meets with another left lower motor neuron, which also hitches a ride on the left facial nerve. The one huge difference is that there's another upper motor neuron that extends down from a region in the right motor cortex, and stays on the ipsilateral or same side to meet with the same lower motor neuron. In other words, there are two upper motor neurons, one from each side of the brain, giving input to one lower motor neuron. The left half of the face is similarly innervated, so that means that each facial nerve contains motor information for the lower face coming from the contralateral motor cortex, and motor information for the upper face coming from both motor cortices. The facial nerve also innervates the sublingual and submandibular glands which secretes saliva, as well as the lacrimal gland, which produces tears, and mucous membranes of the nose, mouth, and nasopharynx. In the ear, it innervates the stapedius muscle, which dampens the vibration of the stapes, a small bone that helps transmit vibrations from the eardrum, and this protects you from loud noises. The facial nerve also carries sensory information about taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So if you lick an ice cream cone, that's the facial nerve registering the flavor. Bell's palsy happens when the facial nerve gets damaged, and although the precise cause is unknown, it's often associated with viral infections like herpes simplex virus, Epstein-Barr virus, and varicella zoster virus, as well as the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease. Regardless of the cause, when the facial nerve isn't able to conduct the brain signals, the result is that there's weakness or paralysis of the facial muscles. Now, it's important to distinguish Bell's palsy from other causes of facial palsy, like a stroke. If the underlying problem is in the brain or brainstem before the upper motor neurons cross the midline, it's called an upper motor neuron lesion. This causes paralysis of only the lower half of the face on the contralateral side as the lesion, since the upper half of the face is still receiving some information from the ipsilateral motor cortex. If there's a lower motor neuron lesion like in Bell's palsy though, where the facial nerve is damaged, information from the contralateral and ipsilateral motor cortex is lost for the upper face, as well as information from the contralateral motor cortex for the lower face. This results in the paralysis of all of the muscles on the side of the affected nerve. The main symptoms of a Bell's palsy can be seen by looking at a person's face. There's an absence of the nasolabial fold, 
which is the skin fold that runs from the side of the nose to the corner of the mouth. There's also drooping of the eyelid and drooping of the mouth. In some people, there's also dryness of the affected eye or mouth. Because the facial nerve innervates the lacrimal, submandibular, and sublingual glands. Sometimes there's also hypersensitivity to loud noises and a loss of taste sensation on the anterior two thirds of the tongue. The diagnosis of a Bell's palsy is based on identifying that the problem is with the facial nerve and not finding an alternative explanation like a stroke or brain tumor. Bell's palsy affects each person differently. Most people recover within six months after the onset, but some people develop permanent facial weakness or paralysis. Treatment isn't needed in all cases of Bell's palsy, but in some severe cases, corticosteroids can help reduce the nerve inflammation and speed up the recovery. Alright, as a quick recap. Bell's palsy happens when there's a disruption of the facial nerve from an unknown cause. The most common symptoms are weakness or paralysis of both the upper and lower facial muscles on one side of the face, which is due to the loss of all lower motor neurons. Bell's palsy is treated with corticosteroids, but in most cases, symptoms usually subside on their own. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. I hope you were able to learn more about Bell's palsy and how to differentiate it between other facial palsies like a stroke or tumor. Um, this video is brought to you by Philip, who wrote the script, um, Rishi and Yifan, who edited the script, Tanner, who did the voiceover, Sam G, who did the video editing, and I did the illustrating. Now, if you're wondering, how can I retain all this amazing knowledge that I have just learned in the past six and a half minutes? Well, go to osmosis.org right now. You will find a ton of materials on there to help you study, like flashcards, quizzes, space repetition, and not only all of that, but we also have over a hundred other videos just like these that have not been released to YouTube. So definitely check it out. And if you love our videos and you love learning from us, be sure to share us with your friends on social media. Um, comment, tell us what you like, what you don't like. We love hearing from you guys and it helps us make better videos for you. So thanks again for watching. See you later.